This is Rob Gordon Bralver, and I am the director and co-writer of Moby Doc. We think that if we have the right amount of money, if we have the right amount of recognition, we'll find perfect human happiness. But I tried, and it didn't work. My life as a musician has taken me to a lot of very odd places. I grew up with two very angry parents who were screaming at each other and drinking. At an early age, I found music. And then there was this day when I learned how to mix two records together. It was like magic. In 1990, I put out a song called Go. I thought it was fantastic. And a lot of other people thought that too. <laughs> All of a sudden, I had a big hit single, and every day I drank more. I started doing drugs. I was out of control. Then I learned my mom died, and I missed her funeral because I was in bed, drunk, passed out. Everything I'd ever wanted had been given to me, and I'd never been more depressed. Deep down, we assume that if anyone looks too closely, they'll be repelled. I was working on this album, Play, and it just sounded terrible to me. Slowly but surely, everybody who discovered the music felt like there was something special there. It started off small, and then it just kept selling more. I was able to take the fear and make it beautiful. None of this was expected. Making music has been baffling, confusing, but wonderful. Sounds like hyperbole, but music saved me. That is a trailer from the documentary Moby Doc, and this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Today we're talking about Richard Melville Hall, better known to most of us as Moby, the electronic music pioneer. Joining us to discuss Moby, the musician and DJ, as well as photographer and animal rights activist, among many other things, and the soon-to-be-released Moby Doc, is writer, producer, and director Rob Gordon Bralver. Rob, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Doing pretty well, thanks. Thank you uh, for having me on. Yeah, well, no, it's great to have you. Um, Moby Doc is the film. We've uh, seen or heard the f- trailer. Uh, releasing on May 28th. I haven't been able to say this in a while, but it's going to have a theatrical release, I gather. Um, and also being released on digital platforms, and certainly in North America. Do you know where it is streaming? Uh, I do not yet, actually. So I'm sure we'll have the news released soon. Uh, I think all of the obvious places, you know. Um <laughs> okay. You will be able to find it on Apple and Amazon and you know everywhere else I expect. Okay. So uh and this also corresponds with the uh, release of Moby's 19th studio album uh, on the same day reprise. Uh I wanted to say reprise but I've now figured out that it is actually reprise. Uh but uh thanks so much Rob for coming onto the podcast and congratulations on getting this released. Um now this may be the probably the stupidest question I've ever asked on this podcast because it seems so obvious, but uh, you know, I'm also aware that I was talking to some uh, Gen Z's and uh, and Millennials and some uh, not as familiar about Moby, who Moby, Moby is and so right. uh, maybe you can tell us what is Moby Doc about? Uh, well, uh, I think the way that um, it makes the most sense to discuss is um which only emerged to us kind of in the process of making it, you know, was that it's not really a music biography or, you know, a biopic Mm -hmm. uh, so much as it is a psychological portrait uh, of a man who happens to be a musician of world, you know, some world renowned. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's a, 
a better way to go into the film as opposed to, you know, um, a traditional music biopic. So okay. it takes place inside the brain. <laughs> uh, so, something like so that. Really, it's a, I mean, it's a film about Richard Melville Hall, a.k.a. Moby, isn't it? I mean, we, we really get Very to much know, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, um, that is who it's about. Yeah. I mean, um, may I ask, do you call him Moby or do you call yeah. him, what do you call him? Is that how you... Refer- usually, usually Moby, if we're in a real flow, uh, then just Mo for short is a good, okay. is a good nickname. But uh, <laughs> yeah, never Richard. So Okay. He's, he's not Richie <clears throat> or Rick or anything like that. I don't so. think he would respond to that unless it was his aunt, uh, you know. Yeah, exactly. But uh, <laughs> um yeah, it's, so it's, you know, it's about Moby and it's his life and career and all of the life lessons he's learned along the way. That's it. And, and I think for maybe even even someone like me who's, who remembers, I mean, we forget just how big, I mean, I know he's still big. He's, a, a, as you say, he's a musician of, of renown, but I mean, he, you know, and we'll get back to this, but, uh, and this isn't your typical music bio uh biopic by any stretch uh, as you've already said but um i think we forget how big he was certainly in those certainly when his album play came out i mean he was yeah. just ubiquitous and mm-hmm. and doing some research myself i mean I, I i see he still resonates that that album was the soundtrack for many people's lives i mean they pretty much i think that's almost a direct quote from someone i think mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. You know, and I think, um, but what we do get to see is maybe something that people weren't aware is, um, and now this is kind of takes us down traditional biopic route, but uh, uh, we are introduced to his backstory, aren't we? Yeah, you certainly get the biographical components. I think it's um, perhaps more in the way that it's presented uh, that may be a little bit more offbeat, but um, yeah, you get, you get, uh, you get all of the greatest hits and most important moments, you know, of his life that, that mm-hmm. shaped him. Um, childhood was obviously a big deal to him, um, as it is for everybody, <laughs> but, yeah. um, yeah. you know, it, it, uh, and I think we focus in on a number of, you know, pretty key moments in his development that, that made him, uh, become both the artist and activist that, uh, he, he grew up to be. Yeah, so he has this very troubled childhood, um, as he is 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 outlined in in, in interesting ways uh, in the uh, in the film, um, and then he you know basically music as he would say um, I think literally I think it's a quote says saves his life, um, mm-hmm. and what I found interesting is I hadn't realized I didn't wasn't aware of his punk background. Um, yeah, but that's right. Uh, he yeah, I mean as as he describes it's uh an evolution you know to to find what what compelled him most and i mean really it's he's um a completely multifaceted musician i mean while you know he's most known for play um he you know he can play on an instrument and he could do you know if you, you could blindfolded have him play any type of music from classical to uh you know thrash metal uh mm he would be equally capable of doing it. Um, but you know, when he was learning as a child, um, you know, he started like anyone does who starts taking piano lessons and guitar lessons with, um, Hmm. more classical background kind of education. And then, uh, you know, the era when he was a teenager was when, you know, you're learning classical with your, uh, teacher, but seeing, uh, things like the clash, Hmm. And bad and bad brains and um, some of these other bands at the time and uh, you know that just I mean, got him a lot more excited and wanted you know he wanted to emulate that and so you can <laughs> as many teenagers might have a similar reaction yeah and and I think um, and as, so I mean I just as someone who is I think of is known of Moby since sort of the uh, let's say mid to late nineties I mean that was a background I hadn't um, you know I I think. As you said, he's multifaceted. Um, we get, um, and people get fixated on the sort of the electronic or electronica element of yeah, it. Yeah, the more so, spacey, uh, you know, which is, you know, it, it sort of has become the bulk of his catalog, I guess, in terms of what's most well known. The um, 
yeah. more ethereal electronic stuff but mm-hmm. you know I've, you can go from album to album and hear you know all kinds of music so yeah and then he um <clears throat> so i mean if i if you do bear with me we'll do a little bit of this sort yeah of what's a bit more traditional uh sort of biopic questions but, no so uh, yeah i'm not how much how much story you want me to tell or like bio you want me to really yeah no it's i don't um, think we we don't need to re we don't need to we don't need to i think it's just helped set the stage for some of our listeners okay. actually just so they they have sure. a better i you know kind of an idea um uh, right. and then to, you know and also kind of uh, serves as a bit of a taster uh so they can uh obviously go uh, right wa- watch the film and uh right. find out for themselves but uh um and he, we're ba- we're a UK based uh, podcast, so mm-hmm. you know he, his first big break really comes here with his mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Go, um, and he becomes this. Uh, I mean, I think kind of what I get to, and it gets back to the psychological portrait, is that he, you know, he does he becomes this uh, dance electronic music giant, doesn't he? In, yeah, in sort of the uh, 90s, that's right. You know, yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I would even listen to. I was not aware of some of the songs that were on "Everything Is Wrong." Uh, it was on some people's album of the year lists and stuff that you know. I, I hear that. I still hear them now. That get they get played mm-hmm. uh, as in whatever context. That's um, it's very tough to escape. There were days when I would leave his house, and uh, you know, after a day of shooting or editing stuff together, and get back to my apartment building, and his, you know, he'd be playing in the lobby. And he, he couldn't escape. <laughs> I was like, man, this just can't get, can't get out of my head. But, uh, yeah. But I guess yeah. what, so, but then he, I mean, he's very, you know, he's very upfront. He's very matter of fact about this um, in the film. His, uh, you know, maybe it's a bit hyperbole, but he's, his career crashes with that album mm-hmm. Animal Rights, doesn't it? I mean, he just, he went in a yes. different direction and, um, the listening public kind of gives them a, a big, big slap, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very much, um, he has sort of uh, almost like a stock ticker. There was like a preliminary rise and then yeah. a very big fall. And then, um, you know, the slow climb back up uh, to, you know, greater heights than ever before. So, but now, And so how, and how did he handle that? I mean, cause I think what we're seeing, we see in the film too, is just this, he's, he's, um, he's struggling with a lot of, well, he has a lot of these demons as well mm-hmm. and from his childhood yeah. and, uh, you know, so, um, it, I mean, it's uh, sort of a sign of his resilience, but how does he handle this? Uh, you know, so mid nineties, he's kind of, he, I think he thinks he's going to have to go back to Connecticut and become a teacher or something, doesn't he? Yeah, it was a definitely, I think, you know, a difficult period for him. Um, you get to that point where you feel like you have, you know, ascended and made it and, no longer need to worry about, um, you know, the, the lifelong career struggle and dreams that you've always had. And mm-hmm. when you think you've got there and then you're on, you know, you're one, one mistake away or not really a mistake, but you know, <laughs> whatever you like isn't what other people liked all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it was, it was a down period for him. And I think he, uh, retreated into, uh, into the booze a lot and, uh, some other things. And that was, uh, a very introspective negative period. I think you would put it that way. Yeah. Um, but like many such uh, periods of torment for artists, it ultimately leads to uh, the gestation of something really great, which was, uh, which was play. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then that comes out in 99 and, but most of us don't hear about it till 2000 for various reasons. And he is, as you said, and even now, it's it's everywhere. He's ubiquitous. He's uh, mm. he's. Uh, I mean, I, I I'll share an antidote. I was uh, I came over here. I'm from the U.S. originally, but I came here to work for the Economist. And um, yeah, they um, about that time he was an inter- interviewed, and he said he read the uh, the Economist from cover to cover every week. And <laughs> oh the, yeah, and all the business and marketing guys of the Economist were like all oh, a buzz. They're like, oh, Moby reads the Economist from cover to cover. That's I, funny. I, I've never read it from cover to cover. I mean, I have no I, I love to skim the Economist, you know. Yeah, it's <laughs> I don't usually read the whole thing. But, uh, yeah, but but I mean, um, you know, so he he was it was Moby. Moby said that it's it was huge news. You know, I mean, it was yeah. uh, 
So no, he, I mean, he, he carved out a place in the culture for himself as I think something, um, more than a musician, you know, for a good long while, he's kind of an iconoclast mm-hmm. and, uh, and someone who, um, you know, he likes to give his opinion about things and yeah. Well, <laughs> speaking of, I mean, I seem to remember back then, even not not too long. I mean, again, this is a sort of what you're documenting. Again, in a bit more traditional way, if if I'm going to look at it that way, is the uh, sort of uh, rise and fall, fame, um, being built up, being torn down. He did face some major blowback after that, didn't he? He did. It was yeah, not a not an easy re- uh, ride or a straight line to success at all. I think you know it's been. Uh... A very you know a choppy and twisty turny road for him and um i think that's one of the things that he really wanted to relate in the film you know it's because there there's a big element i think of this that's meant to be a uh, sort of a cautionary tale for you know not just aspiring artists but you know aspiring anything um that it's just uh you know it, it's seldom the road that you believed it would be when you started you know, whatever your big pursuit might be. And that there's some hope, you know, some, some helpful lessons that he, you know, he likes to pass along from, mm. from the way that he went. Because throughout, throughout all of this, I mean, he's, cause he talks about it. He's now playing with David Bowie. He's got, you know, it's, it's amazing who he's hobnobbing with. Um, but throughout yeah. all this, he's, he's crashing hard, isn't he? Very much so. I mean, so that's, yeah. Uh, this is, you know, one of the, big ironies that he relates in which, you know, people may not be aware of or expect is um, when he was at the top of the world with play um, and 18 to, um, and he was getting all of the VMAs, uh, you know, he, mm-hmm. he was going through a period of, you know, pretty deep depression and suicidal thoughts and things like that, that one, you know, I mean, now there's a lot more awareness of it, but I think maybe back then and only up until very recently, one might not have thought uh, someone living the dream life would be experiencing, you know, um, you have all the money you need and staying at great hotels and cars and dating movie stars and uh, can still be uh, pretty low inside. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, and that's not, not too uncommon a story, but it wasn't, uh, certainly wasn't communicated at the time and people haven't talked about it as openly, I think in up until recent years. So. I think that's a very good point. Actually, we've, we've had a few uh, docs on and guests on and that's, it, it's only 20 years ago, but uh, you know, you look back on it and even 20, just 20 years ago, yeah, a long time in pop culture, uh, history and to end and the manicured nature of, of stars too. You know, I think everyone being so much more, um, transparent now i would think i think you know things were a lot more pr managed uh, in the you know old-fashioned way uh, even 20 years ago so it's funny that's an interesting point also this sort of our own views of mental health and illness and what it means and um if you've got cancer well go get treated if if something is yeah you in your head well there's something wrong with you kind of almost attitude so i think this is a good time to um Take a quick break for our listeners, uh, and we'll be right back with Rob Gordon Browver, writer, director, and producer of Moby Doc. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with writer, director, and producer Rob Gordon Browver. Uh, Moby Doc, releasing on May 28th. Uh, limited theatrical release for those of you in the in North America. Uh, for everyone else, it, it, well, it's certainly on digital platforms in North America on the 28th as well. Everyone else, just uh, pick your favorite. Uh, uh, well, it's going to be Google, let's face it. Google it and see, uh, see. Uh, but it will be out on your various uh, platforms. Comes out same day as Moby's new album, Reprise, on Deutsche Grammophon. Um, Rob, it, it, it's safe to say that this isn't your typical uh, biopic. Uh, it's not a biopic at all, as you've, you've already told us. Uh, how did this project start? Uh, so yeah, I had been doing uh, music videos with Moby and he had been 
kicking around the idea of doing a documentary, I think, you know, for a year or so, um, but without a specific uh, focus for what that would be. I think he just wanted to make one, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, we had developed, a, you know, a good creative rapport and relationship uh, from doing the videos and, um, and we, you know, just kind of naturally got to talking about the doc and what that would be like. Um, and he had a decent amount of footage just kind of compiled from, you know, various events that he does and following him around in his life that uh, we could look at kind of as a start and see if there was anything we wanted to do with that. Um, some of which is, you know, there's just sort of um, mm. verite following around, you know, stuff there's in the film. But um, right. Mostly we kind of just discovered from, from talking and sifting through things, um, you know, all of his old music videos, um, that what he was really getting at was doing, um, uh, something that was like therapy through film, you know? <laughs> and mm. I think he didn't want to do, uh, the standard midlife crisis, um, fading rock star music doc. Uh, as happens, you know, kind of every year you can pick one out. <laughs> um, but instead to try and do something with the format that would be uh, both helpful for him uh, as a, you know, really as a process of a way to sort of sort through his life and make sense of things. And then uh, optimistically um, uh, helpful for viewers, you know, uh, who, who could perhaps be uh, guided to take better choices. <laughs> Right. And some things. So that was the motivation at the beginning. Yeah. Now, I mean, isn't making a doc about yourself potentially could come off as extremely mm -hmm. self self indulgent, couldn't it? Yes, uh, it has that potential. And if anyone you know wants to feel that way about it, they are entitled to. But uh, I think it's uh, it's probably more the norm than it isn't with a lot of. Uh, "Quote unquote rock docs these days, where artists commission projects about themselves, uh, and what's different about this one, I believe, is um, there is a, a candid nature to it, where it's you know it's very confessional uh, to the mm. viewer, I think, um, and as much as might be guarded by uh, doing something about yourself, there's also an openness um, and an avail, you know, an access." that would not be there if it were being uh, come at from a completely outsider's perspective, you know? Mm. So I think, and, and what's, what's not said is as obvious as what is said, you know? And so there's, there's certain things that, uh, you know, you don't, it's, you're not really beholden to explain in someone's entire life in 90 minutes i think right, and right. the thing the things that are chosen to explore in those 90 minutes are um you know worth worth analyzing yeah i mean i think uh, i mean and and you know i have to say we don't won't do spoiler alerts uh well there's a spoiler it's not a spoiler alert because i won't say what he says but uh i mean he's extremely frank about some things okay. that happened that are uh um we, yeah pretty much hit bottom that I don't think your average um, personality, however you want to describe subjects of these, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when rock stars are, or music musicians are the subjects of docs don't usually um, admit to. Um, no, so. it's, it's pretty grim and, you know, and soul bearing. And he says, you know, yeah, any, <laughs> many anecdotes that would not be there were a more airbrush portrait. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and so you're working. So how does this creative process work? Because this isn't. Uh, because obviously you're working with Moby, who's um, he's uh, he's more of an artist than a, just a pure musician. So um, I have to say, I mean, and and whether was was this intentional? It kind of feels like is it. it is it well? It feels like Moby's directing the movie. I know he's not. We know he's. I mean, I can tell people we've got you on here. He's not. But it kind of has that kind of the way it's structured is like he is making this. He even makes fun of it with him wearing a that one scene where he's wearing like a beret. Yeah, pretending. Which we, you know, I had him do. <laughs> uh, you know, 
because there's no point beating around the bush that you know an artist is commissioning a project about themselves but um well what's the, what's the question exactly well what is, what it like? is the process well, like well how's the pro- i mean how is it to, is this i mean is it collaborative how how did you work this yeah, out because you're the director very. and then you're, you're collaborating and then so in terms of the uh as you said earlier this kind of um like a lot of docs it kind of the the story or whatever the the movie itself gradually appears to you um mm-hmm. or you or eventually have a eureka moment i guess um but how did that uh, that work you did you just get cameras yeah. rolling and then no so so yeah the creative process was pretty interesting on this and and unique as well and i think it's it's um interesting to discuss actually as um from a broader filmmaking perspective, actually, in terms of an approach that I found uh, really great uh, relative to other creative processes that I've done. And so, I mean, usually, you know, the, the phases of filmmaking are, uh, you know, script, financing, production, post-production, and it comes out. And with this one, you know, where, where in that one, you know, if you make a mistake, uh, it can be incredibly costly or impossible uh, to mm-hmm. fix something, you know. Yeah. And with this, we had just this sort of rolling uh, production where we would just bat ideas back and forth and, you know, email me things, I'd email him things, we'd sit down and talk about concepts. And uh, it was really just an absolutely everything is on the table approach. Um, and the, I honest, I would struggle to think of in a, a concept that I would put forward to him that he said no to. It was everything was let's you know let's just try it, let's just go do it, um, and we would just film everything, and then we would edit some more of the film and be like, oh, that didn't work, you know, that did work, and go back out and do it a little better or do something different. Um, and the nature of that was actually um, it was it was really great for the energy levels that it requires to make a movie um, where you're not going through these sort of spikes of energy with a lot of people. And then you're kind of isolated writing or editing again, you know, we sort mm-hmm. of had a good steady clip of, you know, let's get into some production and then we'll look at it and get into some production. And then we'll look at it. And we kind of just kept ironing it that way and discovering what the right tone was and, and what we were free to explore. Um, so that, you know, that was really how it worked. It was, um, just very open and, uh, we had a way of just, um, almost beta testing ideas, you know, yeah. uh, where we'd go out, you know, with just the cameras that we have, um, and doing some, you know, <laughs> doing something for zero dollars and then being like, all right, well, that's, you know, kind of fine, but why don't we bring the crew over now and actually do it properly? And, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and so that's, and, and you end up what I think with what feels like, you know, kind of an honest handmade, um, uh, yeah, Yeah, no, I think it's, um, no, I would, I would agree. I think, um, I mean, the thought that's just come to me is, 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 is Moby a fan of, uh, or or maybe not so much a fan, but is he, has he watched these kind of docs? Because it seems to me that now that I think, think about it, it almost seems like he's, a bit of it is is parody in in a way i mean it's it's yeah. serious but i uh, mean we definitely make fun of other docs plenty yeah. you know i mean and i've as someone who's done a number of biographical docs um you know i'm all too familiar with the conventions of them and uh you know what you're you know not supposed to do or how frankly you know other things that I've done where it was not in collaboration with the person it was about. In some cases they passed away or in some cases they were alive and I was doing it more as an outsider that were, you know, 10 times more restrictive um, in terms of the story that you could tell. Uh, And, uh, and then this was, you know, (laughs) with with the person just being like kind of in the rocket seat with you going, you know, you know, I don't care. Let's just, let's just make the weirdest and most interesting thing we can. And if I look like an ass, that's totally fine. You know, and that's, that was, <laughs> that, that was very re- refreshing and different. You know, I mean, I, I, I won't, you know, about other films though. I just, you know, 
someone could have been uh, passed away and exerted more control over the process. <laughs> um, that, that's, yeah. that's, a very, that's very interesting, yeah. actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like with some of the, <clears throat> I mean, there's reconstructions and then there's the really cheesy style reconstructions and there's certainly a few in there that are, you know, it's it, pretty humorous actually. Um, although dealing with serious subjects from his life. Um, and, uh, it seems to be all in there. And I think what I like, I mean, there's this one section where I, I forget where it is. Maybe is it about a third halfway? Th- it's probably about a third through where he even says, okay, that it's been pretty boring, Bio, biopic up through this point so let's go do something different yeah you know well it's like yeah we were obliged to tick the biographical boxes yeah. you know it's it, you have to tell the basics of his life in order for the um messages that he wants to communicate later uh, to mean anything right you have to know where he's coming from and what he's been through but it was it's it's very much a struggle for me to make anything interesting that's a retrospective look at someone's life you know this is what happened to the person when they were five and yeah, it's yeah. to not to not ken burns everything you know yeah. as most docs do is so that's uh we, it just that just that was you know it really motivated us to just be um as lighthearted with it as possible i guess so what is he trying so what is he trying to achieve or are you you too are trying to achieve with this film uh well it's it's a long year so since i thought about it but i think um for him um it's what he says in the film you know um that the relentless pursuit of rock stardom and fame and money um and drugs and whatever else that you know i think still quite a significant number of people um dream about you know (laughs) as being the be all end all to your life uh there is more often than not uh no you know nothing on top of that mountain and you get up there and it's uh not a particularly great place to be um and so i think as much as that can be communicated to uh to people who are younger um or older and just be 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 helped uh, back onto a you know maybe a safer gent a gentler and more rewarding path. Uh, then that would be a positive thing. You know mm. that's uh, almost as simple as that. You know, it's just pay pay attention to what you know is is you know is actually good for you. So yeah. I, I think it it does remind me of a uh, we had R J we've had R J Cutler on twice actually but he did the Belushi doc mm. um, mm. and he's got a scene in there where he's got a great quote from the um, guy he just passed away a few weeks ago Tony Hendra is a British American comedian um, comic writer who said something about you know certainly more particularly about the U S but just in general this this pursuit of um, of material things really. Uh, mm-hmm. Just you, once you've achieved what you're trying to achieve, well, then what the question always is: What's next? How yeah, then what? That? <laughs> then what? Yeah, yeah. You know exactly. What's your next mountain? And that's you know, there's a lot of recurring imagery in this film of Moby literally alone on top of a desert landscape, and there's yeah. nothing there. And you know, it might might be a fairly obvious visual metaphor, but you know, that's kind of what it's all about. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's something that everyone I think struggles with, whatever their field might be. Um, you 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 get the thing, and then you're like, all right, yeah, I don't figure out what I want to do next. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a I I think it's a good point. Again, as you're talking about him being so upfront about things, uh, pretty much says every album after play was not quite as successful as the one before. I mean, for whatever reason. I mean, not it's just. Um, how do you top something? I, I forget how many. Uh, yeah, yeah you know, 20 million. You know, you're not going to really do better than that. It's, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so, no. it, yeah, it, and then a lot of people have one good book in them, you know, and then everyone keeps looking, you know, yeah. what are these next five books? Nobody read them. I don't know. It's, yeah. uh, and then uh, 200 years later, some scholar comes across <laughs> them and says, these exactly. things are amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this one's even better. Whoa, yeah, exactly. Wow. So How maybe, maybe that'll yeah. happen. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's a lot of it is that, though. It's a cultural moment. You know, I mean, it's just the world being as it was in 99. And 
yeah. his music hit, hitting when it did and uh, the licensing of a lot of it, you know, it helped, yeah. helped spread it. But yeah, you, it's very difficult to repeat the exact same circumstances, you know, mm-hmm. impossible usually. So. But I mean, this does coincide with the release of his 19th album, Reprise. Uh, now, I uh, was that uh, obviously it's intentional. They're releasing on the same day, but it, was that? <laughs> it's in, it was, it's in, no, yeah, <laughs> it's intentional now, uh, but it, it wasn't up until you know we were making the film for a few, you know, the last three years, yeah. and it you know it just so happened in the last year coinciding with the timing of us finishing the film. Hey, I'm also finishing this new album, you know, so we might as well release them on the same day. And, uh, obviously, that made sense, but it was, you know, not from the out. It wasn't the idea originally from the get go. But the thing is, what, uh, yeah. So he's got some interesting. So I, he's got some interesting videos on his web website about sort of the some of the backstories of some of these songs because this is a kind of a greatest hits, um, but with orchestral and acoustic versions. And were you involved with some of those um, some of those shorts that are on on his website? Um, I helped him with the with the music video for Natural Blues, but I didn't do anything okay. else with that. Yeah. Okay, because I, I think that's part of that's um, it was interesting. It's a it's how do you put this? It's almost the, a different side of him. You know, the doc is mm-hmm. one is one side, which is, as you said, is a psychological portrait of someone trying to come to grips with their life and where they are. Um, whereas the, um, some of these things on that social media and, and YouTube and places like this are very interesting. It's all about sort of the, the creative process, things that I had not, uh, probably he doesn't yeah. get enough credit for, to be honest. Yeah. I haven't seen those exact videos, but I know that, you know, the kinds of making ofs that you, you mean, um, yeah, I know he loves doing those, and a lot of people who follow him on social media are obviously, you know, aspiring musicians and uh, otherwise music fans. Um, so I think, you know, he really enjoys being able to just show people, um, you know, just how he does what he does and make mm-hmm. it relatable. Okay. And, um, I mean, do you have any more Moby projects in the works? Or are you about moby out at this at this point? <laughs> That's a good question. Um <laughs> I think I wouldn't be surprised if we did, you know, one or two more music videos past that. Yeah. I don't know. But, you know, I'd always be up for another video. They're, they're a lot of fun and they don't take that long. So, you know, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think we did our thing in this feature pretty well and, uh, you know, achieved what we wanted to when we started of making something that was, uh, yeah, just, just a, a different look at the creative process. Yeah. So that's a good question. He's he's happy with the end product. Yeah, you wouldn't be seeing it. <laughs> you wouldn't okay. be seeing it if he wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it is. I mean, I think I remember when we first, you know, had lunch about it, uh, and we're talking about things like um, the diving bell and the butterfly, and um, yeah, being John Malkovich and some right. other, you know, yep. any yep. anything that takes place inside someone's head as they examine these vignettes of their life, you know, and that was to see if we could do a music doc that even remotely emulated that kind of feeling. And, um, you know, Tessa does that. We'll see if anyone else thinks that. Yeah, no, the ref, no, that it's interesting. So. That's a very good point. Cause the references are, are, are narrative. They're not other docs are they? I mean, no. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I, Frank, as someone who makes docs, I can't stand watching most docs and, uh, <laughs> because I'm just too, you know, I'm too aware of it, you know, and it's like yeah. the number of things you turn on. It can be about a subject I'm fascinated by, but uh, I'm if I'm seeing talking heads sitting on a couch intercut with a photo uh, for the duration of the thing, it's very mm-hmm. difficult, you know, to, st- <laughs> to stay engaged. Um, so as much as we could avoid that, we did, I think, uh, other than David Lynch is in the film. So, uh, you know, I I can't believe I hadn't actually asked you about that. That's actually it is amazing to have him him in there. Um, um, because I was about to. I mean, he's uh, um, well, you've got him. You've got a, a you know, you've got a, a well, a few others. Well, I think that's the only real sort of talking head type. Yeah. Element. Yeah. 
Yeah. But even and that, which we it? yeah. It's David Lynch, right? So you're if you're allowed one <laughs> get out of jail free card and there's a talking head, well it's David Lynch, so that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh and uh, yeah, we tried to spice it up a little bit, but yeah. yeah. It's uh <laughs> but I mean what for you, because you've made a I think you've made a very good point. What what makes a good engaging doc in terms of your your besides I mean, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, that's a constant search. Um, it's uh, for you know, and what is interesting to me and might not be uh, to to anybody else, but I, it's really just a question of energy and engagement. Mm. You know, um, it's very easy to get bored these days, um, and uh, as everyone always points out, there's a million other things to flip to. Yeah. So the challenge is really on you as a filmmaker to to just keep it interesting uh, or different, whatever you know, whatever that mm-hmm. might be. Um, so it's really you know we would just throw things at the wall until they make us laugh. You know that was mm-hmm. obviously the the approach more often than not was like, is that funny? Is that stupid? I don't know. Keep it. Throw it out. You know, it's uh, just just having that kind of free creative spirit to to do anything remotely differently um and it's just you know we got lucky that it that approach synthesized well with moby's creative persona i think you know Mm -hmm. so the the film can reflect his there's there's um sort of a literary side and a whimsical Mm -hmm. side and uh you know he has all these other things that he's known for so for Mm -hmm. you know if the film if you know if this had been a piece that was uh really by the numbers and literal it would not be reflective of the guy he is yeah. right or, or what his what yeah. his fan, fans uh want so i think hopefully it makes his fans feel uh that this you know this is a moby film you want it to feel like a moby film um so <laughs> there you know it is so the whimsy <laughs> element is one that did strike me in that going back to that economist quote or anecdote I made is in in retrospect I'm thinking you know all these interviews over the years that he's given I mean I I wonder how much of it to some of it to take with a grain of salt I mean obviously he's got things he's very serious about but I often mm-hmm. wonder how much is you know the real Moby is he just kind of like oh here I is another interview here's this guy like me or someone asking me questions I'm just gonna <laughs> I might just feed him along, yeah. you know, and let him run with it, you know. Yeah, tough to say. I'm, I'm sure there are some where he's being uh, very serious and others where he's not. <laughs> no. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's too many for me to assess. But um, <laughs> so, so you've, um, I mean, um, and we're actually, it's hard to, hard to believe where I think we're coming close to the yeah. end of our, our time together. But uh, um you mentioned, uh, I think, before we actually started recording, uh, but uh, you've got this uh, uncle who uh, was in the film industry. But how did you get started with oh, yeah. the doc films um, yourself? Uh, sure, yeah. It's um, kind of, I think it's a common story with docs, um, wanting to make films and documentaries just being an easier access point. You know, um, mm. it's cheaper to, make it, cheaper to make them. You don't need a giant budget and a giant crew and all of this stuff. And you can just kind of shoot with whatever you have and start cobbling things together. Um, and I was lucky enough to get uh, brought into um, a music doc when I was still in college uh, about Mark Sandman, who was the lead singer of the band Morphine in the nineties. So right. yeah. I accidentally ended up doing these nineties music docs 20 years later. I don't, you know, I don't know why, not by plan. It just <laughs> it ended yeah. up being what happened. Um, yeah. but, uh, so I did that one, um, which, you know, did its thing. And I think, you know, morphine fans, um, really appreciated it. Mm-hmm. And, um, that led to another music doc and, uh, kind of just doing the bio thing in general and, and did the Gore Vidal film yeah. from some years ago. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just, it's just kind of, uh, the medium that has, uh, you know, appeared before me. That's <laughs> the thing to do. So. And as you said, a bit of a music theme, is that something you're going to stick with? Or you? Or I don't do think you know so, yet? you know. 
Um, I don't really, the, uh, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure if I could pick it, that I would be done with music films, but I said that before the Moby films. So, um, I think if the right thing came along, that was about an artist I was, you know, extremely interested in, um, that it had, a, you know, that had an, an interesting approach then maybe, but, um, I'm more interested in, you know, almost anything else. <laughs> So, um, you know, there's only well, so I mean, many ways to skin this cat. Yeah, I, well, I've, I've, I mean, there's that, and I've also heard, um, I've had people tell me that music docs are a lot of work. Uh, they are. They take a long time. You know. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's the way to put it. They, they do take a very long time. I guess in this case, you didn't have to worry about all those music rights and those kind of things because no, Moby's got that was a big. Yeah. yeah, that was a big plus. All the music in the world was uh, available to use, so that was pretty great. Um, yeah. You know, I had his whole catalog, obviously, you know, uh, is put to use in the film. Um, mm. So that that was a very nice tool to have in the kit, you know, when making this. Okay. And what's or do you know what is next for you? Um, I'm looking at some stuff more in the scripted world. Um, okay. But I cannot say anything more about any of it at this time, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, that's just the nature of things. I, I don't even know yeah. why I ask that question anymore because people are always saying, "Well, I've got this and that," but I really can't say any more about it. But it's just the nature of the of the game, isn't it? Yeah, until, yeah. Until something drops for sure, you can't really. Yeah. Uh, can't when there's much. news, there will be news. Exactly. <laughs> uh, All right. But, hey, well, so. Um, Congratulations again with uh, getting this made, um, getting it released. Um, I'm sure it will. Uh, I'm sure will make a splash. Um, and uh, you know, uh, thanks again for coming on, Rob. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on and uh, ch- talking to you about uh, about Moby Duck, which uh, releases on May 28th, and as well, Moby's 19th studio album, Reprise, also releases on May 28th on. Deutsche Gramophone. If you have any questions regarding how you can become a documentary director and producer like Rob Gordon Browver or other roles in the industry, I recommend you check out careersinfilm.com to learn more about careers in the film industry. I want to give a shout out to Inner Sound Audio just outside of York, England, and a big thanks to Nevena Paunovic, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting such guests like Rob onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.